Yeah, sorry. Of course, I start with a typo in the title, but okay. <laughs> Things happen. Uh, so um, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here. It's a pleasure for me uh, and uh, the opportunity to present my work uh, that I'm doing is going to be out soon, hopefully, uh, doing uh, in collaboration with uh, Mariana Grania and Dimitrios Turikas. Can you hear me well, the volume and everything? Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, and the subject is, uh, is going to be about uh, the 10-dimensional description of uh, KKLT. Uh, so some other people have already uh, worked on this along with us, uh, and so I'll, I'll mention them in due course. Okay, um, so the idea for the talk is the following. Uh, I'm going to give some introduction, uh, motivations, but I clearly in this audience, I don't need to motivate too much why KKLT uh, it's an interesting thing to to understand uh, and why we need uh, more tools to understand exactly how it works. Um, then I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce a, a couple of uh, important facts about the formalism I'm gonna be using uh, about generalized complex geometry compactifications. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about how the Gagino condensate uh, affects this description or this this formalism and how to recover what we get in the KKLT for dimensional effective theory from uh, smearing these seven brains. Okay, so let's start. So you all know, at least of have heard several times, what the KKLT mechanism looks like. The idea for this is to get uh, in type 2B, a setting where we where we try to obtain a the Caesar compactification in type 2 string theory, type 2B string theory. Uh, in three or two steps, depending on who you ask. The first one uh, is about starting from a supersymmetric compactification uh, to Minkowski in four dimensions, where the internal geometry looks like a conformal clavio, and the complex structure moduli are, are fixed uh, by using the three form fluxes. Uh, the second step comes from including the Gagino condensation on, on a stack of D7 brains, so this is a non perturbative effect, or uh, one can also use uh, Euclidean DC brains uh, wrapping an internal four cycle. And the idea is that in the 4D effective theory, it was shown in the original paper that uh, this leads to a supersymmetric IDS4 solution where all moduli are fixed, including the Kähler ones, by using these non perturbative effects. Um, and the cosmological constant is very small. Um, and then there's a, a third step. Uh, with, where one tries to uh, uplift this solution uh, to the sitter. Uh, by using some source of uh, positive energy, usually uh, anti-D3 brains at the bottom of a, of a warp throat. But I'm not going to talk much about this. Uh, the idea for the talk would be to focus on how to describe this uh, ADS4 solution with, with all moduli fixed, the supersymmetric one, um, from the 10-dimensional point of view. Um, and so let, let me kind of state here the the main uh, the main equations that I'm gonna try to recover from 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 the ten dimensional formalism. The idea is that we have some some supersymmetric. Can you see the mouse by the way? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a, a super potential which where some of it comes from the flux part and is dependent is independent of that Kähler uh, of the Kähler uh, moduli, and then there is some non perturbative contribution, and then there is a Kähler potential here. Which takes this form, and by using sigma uh, as the imaginary part of the Keller um, modulus rho, uh, one finds an IDS4 solution where the, for example, the on shell value of this uh, superpotential takes this form here, where sigma star is the actual uh, value at which uh, sigma is stabilized. Uh, here, this uh, W naught is usually thought uh, as coming from 0, 0,3 fluxes, three form fluxes. Um, and this A uh, is a parameter that comes from the gauge theory formalism. And in a, in a simple way, one can think about it as 2 pi over n, where n is the number of colors if the superdiagonal theory is SUN, has gauge group FC SUN, but on, on the descent brains. But uh, also, if we think about the send limits, it's going to be SO8 if we think about descent brains on top of uh, all send planes. So this, this uh, coefficient would be a little bit different, different but the idea is going to be the same. And the idea is to try to answer three questions. How does this work from the 10-dimensional point of view? How do the 
get gene abundance side effects uh, back react on the geometry and how does this uh, relate to the no scale separation for supersymmetric ideas for solutions in the swamp plant program of course as i was saying we're not the first ones to to think about this, this is a long and probably incomplete list of papers that have tried to think about this in one way or another uh, and in particular recently we've seen this uh, very interesting series of papers here uh, trying to give more and more explicit uh, constructions for this, uh, which I think are very nice. Um, and so uh, I'm going to try to relate to some of them, but but uh, this is the kind of the list of references I have in mind. Um, OK, so the tools we're going to use are going to be tools about generalized complex geometry. The idea is the following. We start from a type 2 compactifications to compactification to four dimensions. Uh, this H is going to be the internal metric. Uh, I'm going to work in the string frame. This G is, uh, is the external metric, which is going to be either Minkowski or ADS. Uh, and this is the warp factor, which depends on the internal coordinates. And the idea in general is to think about the supersymmetric solutions as, a, as solutions where, where the internal manifold has a, has a reduced holonomy group, uh, where we have two uh, globally defined spin or, uh, spinners, L, which I'm going to call eta 1 and eta 2. And the idea is that these are the ones that you use when you construct the supersymmetric generate uh, the, the supersymmetry generators in this way. Uh, this uh, this these ones here are going to be the four-dimensional external part, and these ones here are the internal ones, which are these ones here, eta one and eta two. Uh, and the four-dimensional parts have to satisfy uh, this type of uh, differential equation. Sorry. Um, and this mu parameter here fixes the value of the of the cosmological constant in four dimensions. Um, there's a sign difference in this formalism when you talk about type 2b or type 2a, but the idea is uh, more or less the same. So what we're, what we're going to be doing is to encode all the internal geometry into these objects, which are called, uh, depending on where you look at, pure spinners or polyforms. Uh, these are constructed as, uh, uh, as uh, gamma matrix contractions of uh, the spinners eta one and eta two with a different sign here, and so uh, psi plus is going to be a polyform, which is a sum of uh, of uh, even forms, and psi minus is going to be a polyform, which is a sum of only odd forms. Uh, also, conventionally, this uh, norm of the of the spinners can be related to the warp factor, um, and the idea is that one can recast uh, the supersymmetry conditions, so the variation, the vanishing of the variations of the gravitino and the dilatino in the following form. Uh, this was done in this, in this series of papers here for the first time. Um, and so these, these are recast uh, as, uh, as differential equations, or uh, in terms of this twisted differential operator here, which includes the, the Schwartz three form, uh, acting on these uh, spinners uh, psi two and psi one, which depend, which are even either the odd or the even one, depending on where you're on, on type uh, to A or to B. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have uh, the terms which appear when you have non trivial cosmological constant, and also the for the, the uh, Ramon Ramon fluxes, which are all encoded uh, in this, in this uh, F tilde, where I'm assuming the, the democratic formalism. Uh, and this tilde means that it's the Hodge star, and then uh, the action of the alpha operator, which is just a sign depending on uh, how many legs. Um, the, the degree of this differential form. Um, OK, so the one, one very nice thing about this formalism is that all of these supersymmetry equations can be obtained as a F and D flatness conditions uh, for what I'm going to call the generalized complex geometry superpotential, which is written in this way. It's uh, integrated over the internal manifolds. Um, and uh, the the Holomorphic fields one is to use here are defined as Z and T, where they include the, the polyform psi 1 and psi 2, uh, the B field also, so these are twisted in a sense, and also the dilaton and the warp factor here. So they contain, these objects contain all the information about all of these uh, things, all of these fields. Um, and if the if this system of equations uh, is to be self-consistent, the idea is that this mu that appears here has to be related to the on-shell value of the superpotential itself. So more precisely, the on-shell evaluation of the superpotential, which can be obtained by just plugging these equations back into this expression, 
uh, gives you back mu, this parameter mu appearing here times n, where n uh, is this uh, warped volume here. Uh, and it's related to the Kähler potential in the effective theory. Okay. Um, so as an example for uh, how this uh, looks like in, in one of the familiar cases, we can look at SU3 structure compactifications uh, in type 2b, uh, where these, uh, these uh, spinors uh, are uh, parallel or, are, or the, the phase between them is constant all along the internal manifold. So one can think about basically only one of them. And in this case, the, the odd polyform reduces to the just the holomorphic three form, and the even one reduces to the exponential of the of the real Kähler form. In this case, the superpotential itself basically reduces to the usual book of alpha with an expression. Uh, and the supersymmetry conditions give uh, these following uh, conditions. So this line here tells me that I have a that, that this uh, up to these war factors here. Uh, these exponentials with the war factor on the dilaton, uh, omega and j are both closed. It means that I'm uh, in, uh, using a conformal Calabi-Yau manifold. And then I have a relation between the war factor and the five form flux here, and the fact that the dilaton, the axial dilaton, has to be holomorphic. Moreover, uh, from these conditions, uh, we also get that the cosmological constant has to vanish. Uh, when I when I set when when I start with uh, these equations here, and I impose that I want to have SU three structure uh, in the type two B case, then uh, the cosmological constant has to vanish. So this is a Minkowski compactification, and in terms of the three form flux which combines the Ramon Ramon and the Neumann Schwarz one, um, in the usual in the usual way, we find that it has to be both imaginary self dual and that its component is a zero comma three component has has to vanish. Okay. Okay, nice. Um, so let me start with uh, how does the presence of the Gagino condensate affect this, this story. The idea uh, is that it's going to affect each of the, I'm going to try to motivate each of the modifications of the three supersymmetry equations uh, as follows. Um, so for the first one, uh, there is this extra term here. This is an extra localized term. This delta two is uh, the Poincaré dual to, uh, I'm going to be thinking explicitly about D7 brains in this case, but the, the whole idea can be written down for a general, uh, in general, in type 2B and type 2A for a general brain wrapping different cycles. Um, but the main point here, let me focus on the D7 case for concreteness. So these D7 brains are wrapping an internal four cycle. Uh, and here, what I get is a modification which has the um, the delta two, which is a two form delta function, which is a Poincare dual of that cycle. Uh, and then S here, which is which corresponds to the value of the superfield I, I the, the onshore value of the superfield I, I identify with the whose, whose lowest component I identify with the gauge in a six. Um, so this was motivated in these papers here. Um, and the idea for that, for how this comes about, is the following this extra term, I can think of it as coming from the fact that the, I, I have some uh, non-perturbative effects that are affecting my, my super young mills effective theory or my, the, the theory on the D7 brains. Uh, and that's related to what's the young, mill, what's the young mills coupling in that effective four dimensional theory. But if I think about this from the 10 dimensional point of view, this uh, young mills coupling uh, is actually related to uh, the volume or the complexified volume of this four cycle. Um, so this is the precise identification. And if you stare at, at this, this object here is exactly what I defined as one of, of the of the two holomorphic fields. This is what I called T before. Okay. And since this equation, um, since, since this equation uh, corresponds to the F flatness condition uh, of the generalized complex geometry superpotential with respect to with respect to T, uh, then this is going to give me an extra term there. Um, with uh, which is going to be proportional to this delta two if I if I think about this integral as uh, over the full uh, six dimensional internal manifold, and this this is uh, easy to see from the usual uh, Venetiano Jankelowicz superpotential for the for Gagino condensation. So no, what the non perturbative non perturbative effects do is to generate basically these terms here. Um, so this is the end the number of colors. This is mu naught, which is the, the uh, scale at which this uh, coupling is defined. Um, 
And so I, I get an extra, this is kind of the, the super potential that captures the, the non-perturbative physics uh, happening uh, at the level of the gauge theory on the design brains. Um, and from this term here, I have a, where I have a tau, and this tau is this tau D7 here. I see that I'm going to get an extra contribution to the F flatness condition, uh, which is a derivative of this term with respect to uh, T, which is exactly this term here. Okay. Um, in other words, what, I, what, I, what one also sees, uh, as usual, is that this fixes the value of what the, what the um, on-shell uh, vacuum expectation value for the, for the Gagino condensate is uh, in this exponential form, uh, this exponential dependence on the gauge coupling tau, uh, and gives the, the usual uh, extra term, this, this whole thing here, evaluates to n times uh, this expectation value, which is the, the expression used in the KKLT uh, description for the effective theory. Um, and we argued in this, uh, in this uh, paper here that, that basically um, this whole story is uh, encoding, I, I use this, this blocking something or? Are you, can you see? Okay. So we argue in this uh, paper here that this story that I'm describing, uh, basically what it does is it, uh, it manages to encode the 10 dimensional description of uh, how the Kähler modulus is stabilized. Uh, and furthermore, um, since the second supersymmetry condition is can still be written as the derivative of this condition here in the case of uh, where this uh, cosmological constant is non-trivial, uh, we see that uh, the second supersymmetry condition is not modified by the Gagino condensate. On the other hand, uh, we have for the third supersymmetry condition, this extra term here. So this has been motivated in different forms in this paper before by Martucci and Dimarski and by uh, Monkey and collaborators. Um, assuming that the structure is very close to being SU3. So basically what they got is this, uh, instead of psi minus here, there was just an omega, which is what this becomes uh, in, the, in the SU3 structure limit. Uh, and what I'm gonna try to argue is that there's no need for assuming for assuming this in order to argue that, that this is the exit form of the correction to the third supersymmetry condition. Um, and this comes as follows. Well, and this delta zero is uh, defined in this way. It's basically the contraction of the delta two with a metric. Um, and this comes as follows. So we know that um, in without the Gagino condensates, uh, it is true that um, taking a derivative of these equations here, of this third supersymmetry equation, gives precisely the flux equation of motion. So the, the flux equation of motion are, are a, a consequence of this equation here when I have no Gagino condensate. However, when I have a Gagino condensate, there's a coupling between the fluxes and the Gagino, which gives a new source in this case. Uh, and so I want to try to get a modification of this supersymmetry condition, which ensures that with this extra term coming from the gauge, the coupling within the, the fluxes and the gauge in, in more, more precisely in the gauge mass term, on the descent brains, this still gives the correct equation of motion uh, that I get from the total action. And indeed, this is what happens. Um, and uh, we can check that this is exactly what, what has to happen because, can I move this? We can check that this is exactly what has to happen because uh, we computed in this paper uh, the Gagino mass term in the in the context of this of, of d brains wrapping internal cycles in generalized complex geometry compactifications without assuming anything about them, in particular without assuming that they're close to a SU3 structure. Uh, and we managed to rewrite the mass term in the Gagino uh, action in this way. So this this shows that the coupling that I have between, for example, the Ramon Ramon fluxes uh, and, the, and the psi minus pure spinner uh, in this mass term is exactly, uh, gives exactly an extra contribution to the equation of motion, which is what comes from exactly from this modification here in the third supersymmetry condition. Okay. Um, so this is how we think, uh, I mean, it, it's, it looks kind of a simple generalization of this. Um, I think it kind of, uh, Completes in some sense, or it's complementary to the previous points of view. 
Um, uh, and I'm going to try to argue why I think uh, also it's important to think about it in this in this way in general. Um, but let me maybe stop for uh, you usually do questions at the end, right? Uh, Alvaro told me, okay. Uh, anyway, if you want to interrupt, just interrupt. Um, okay, so I'm gonna work with this modified supersymmetry conditions. So again, the second one is not modified, and I have the new term in the first supersymmetry condition and the new term in the second one. Um, and again, as, as discussed uh, a bit briefly in the appendix of, of Monkey's paper, this uh, this this system of equations is consistent with the generalized complex geometry superpotential in the sense that, I don't, if you remember, I, I showed at the beginning that if you evaluate in this set of equations, if you evaluate the, the superpotential, you get mu times n, and that's what you should get if the, if the system is consistent. Um, in this case, you can check that when you evaluate the generalized complex geometry, including these extra terms, okay, you get two localized to localize in the sense of uh, in the integrand, two new contributions here. And these two new contributions precisely cancel each other. If you use the definition of delta two and the definition of delta zero I, I gave uh, at the beginning of, of this section. Um, so we see that if these two exactly cancel each other, then these modifications of the system of equations leads to a, a kind of a consistent system and every every one of the relevant ingredients in the story is contained in this generalized complex geometry formalism. And this is kind of similar to the discussion of, uh, of geometric transitions in, in some limit of, of this uh, formalism done in this paper here. Um, okay, but let me try to show you why, why I think this set of equations is, is kind of powerful in a sense. Um, I'm gonna try to work in a different way from uh, what has been done before. I'm gonna motivate it by why, what was done recently uh, in the studies of the of, uh, DGKT compactifications, the so-called DGKT compactifications in, in type 2A. I'm gonna, instead of trying to go, to go at once for the full, um, and I should rush here a bit, instead of to go uh, directly to the, to the full localized solution, I'm gonna try to work first with a smeared approximation, okay? And the smeared approximation is as follows. I'm going to replace this delta 2 in the equations by the multiple of j and the appropriate uh, warp factors and dilatons. And this delta 0 is going to be replaced by some uh, scalar function, obviously. And these constants are chosen precisely so that I keep uh, these definitions true. Okay, So that this the, the volume of this, this force cycle, this sigma 4, which is a sigma uh, at the beginning of the, of the talk, is still uh, I want this to, to still be true. So when I replace this by this expression here with some constant gamma, I define my gamma such that uh, the same thing holds. So this is the expression I get, okay? When I do that, I see that the, there's a question maybe? Ah, okay. When I do that, I see that the problematic um, two-form component of the first supersymmetry equation, and, and I, I say problematic because this is the, clearest one in which one sees that the localized solution cannot have an SU3 structure uh, internal manifold, you see that uh, in this in this mirrored approximation, the two terms on the right hand side, the, the new one with the Gagino condensate and the old one with the with the cosmological constant combine precisely in this way. So if this condition here is satisfied, then I don't need to have a one form in the in the odd pure spinner. So this suggests that it's possible to have an SU3 structure solution for this system. And indeed, when you do this in the rest of the equations, you get this, this here works the same. So the compactification, compactification is going to be conform my Calabiao, but in the sixth form equation of this, this same supersymmetry condition, you get an extra contribution which tells you that you have some 0, 0,3 components, uh, never Schwartz, uh, three form flux which is also proportional to the, to the cosmological constant. And moreover, when you look at the third supersymmetry condition, here it turns out that when you replace this and use this condition here, that is necessary for this whole thing to exist, this relation between the cosmological constant and the gauge in a condensate and this gamma that I defined here, then 
the two terms in this on the right hand side of this equation cancel exactly. So what this tells you is that the the third supersymmetry equations okay, equation works exactly as it did in the Minkowski case at the beginning without any Gagino condensation. So this gives you a, a, a and the, also we can check that the that the Bianchi identities are satisfied. Um, so this gives a smear solution um, with Gagino condensates, which has everything that we thought it should have from the effective theory point of view. It is conformal Calabi-Yau with holomorphic tau, which because the holomorphicity of tau comes from one of the components of, of this, and we have this uh, appearing here as well. The G, the G3 flux is still imaginary self-dual, but now the big difference is that there is a non-trivial 0,3 component. Uh, and the extended directions, instead of being Minkowski, they are ADS4, and they are ADS4 precisely with the same value of the on-charge superpotential that I was showing at the beginning. So this comes from using the fact that the system is consistent, so I still have this. Then using the relation between mu and the Gagino condensate and this constant gamma, using the explicit form of this constant gamma, and then using the explicit relation between what we called at the beginning the non-perturbative superpotential uh, and this coefficient a and the, the value, the on-charge value of the, of the condensate. Um, and let me say as a comment, I won't have much more to say about, about this uh, in this talk, uh, but at least from this point of view, everything seems to work according to uh, the results of the effective theory in KKLT. This is kind of a, uh, of a nice 10-dimensional uh, way of seeing it, and it's kind of expected that at least in the smearing uh, limits, uh, this is exactly what the, for the, the effective theory should capture. Um, and uh, it seems that from this point of view, at least, there, there doesn't seem to be an, an obstruction to have a scale-separated uh, ADS4 from the Kaluza grain scale, um, at least when this uh, small 0,3 flux can be achieved. Um, and then just to comment on the on the localized uh, solution, so I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, much of it was was discussed in the, in the monkey's paper. There are some. In, in some approximation, one can study what, what this looks like. One has to use a dynamical SU2 structure uh, to construct it, which is uh, more complicated to handle, and one has to include imaginary anti self dual fluxes. Um, however, one, one issue that's, that's interesting is that uh, the evaluation of the on shell action can contain uh, divergent terms in the sense of when you use the solutions of the, of the supersymmetry equations and you plug them back into the action itself. You, because of these uh, localized terms in the supersymmetry equations here, um, when you when you insert everything, you can get it. It, it seems that you can get uh, divergent terms where these delta functions appear square. Um, and this has been studied uh, both in this uh, paper in the paper by Monkey and collaborators, and in this paper by by Gar. This series of papers by Gary and collaborators. Um, and uh, without reaching a, a common conclusion uh, between these two uh, approaches. Um, and what I'm what I think is interesting and what we found is that um, this was studied in this paper by using several approximations, and I'm, and I'm about to finish here, um, using several approximations, uh, because as I was saying, this solution is complicated. But it turns out that if you use uh, the formalism as introduced, the expressions introduced in the in this paper by Luz, Marcel, Sano, Martucci, and Simsis. <coughs> Sorry. One can one can evaluate the on shell action without knowing any of the details of the solution, because what they did in this paper, um, well, in part of this hundred pages paper, is to is to Rewrite, for example, this all the bulk terms in the in the supergravity action in terms of things that look like squares of the supersymmetry equations. So the only thing I need to know to evaluate this is to assume that some solution exists which satisfies these equations here. But because I don't sorry, need you, to... you have three minutes. Yes, thank you. But I don't need to actually know any of the details of the solution. Everything here, every term here can be evaluated explicitly just by using the supersymmetry equations without, again, trying to obtain, for example, 
explicitly all the fluxes and everything. Um, and what we found, that these are still some uh, a bit preliminary results, is that we, we do find that uh, some divergences remain here and that uh, some counter terms seem to be seem to be required. Um, <laughs> so in this sense, I think uh, we do not agree with the with the, or we seem to get something different with the with some of the results in the appendices of of your paper monkey. Um, I don't know exactly where the origin of this discrepancy is, um, but it seems at least in from this point of view that uh, that this uh, seems to be required and the counter terms seem to be at least uh, formally similar to those in the, in the, in these papers here. Um, however, there's no one thing I, I can say is that there's no it doesn't seem to be either such a simple mechanism as a perfect square structure, for example. Um, okay, and more of this is going to be in the in the paper soon. Okay, uh, so this is my summary. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a of a, head, uh, of a throat ache. Um, so this is what we did. I already. Uh, told you uh, more or less everything and the paper is going to be out soon so let me let me not repeat it but what we want to do next <clears throat> as a follow up from from all this is to find the relation and differences in the studies with the with these papers that I was saying uh, in the treatment of the divergences consider the localized solution in the more in the again in Similar to the approach in uh, in the DGKT treatment, in the sense of unsmearing order by order this this uh, this uh, smeared approximation that that I used here, um, and and also it would be nice to understand if there's some hidden obstruction for the for this uh, scale separation of that, that seems to be fine at least at this level. Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank the nice talk by Nico. Uh, if Let's clap, uh, use clap emojis and clap. Uh, is there any question for Nico? I, I only have a have a brief comment. So uh, I first of all agree it's very beautiful to impose supersymmetry and, and get the results. Uh, but then I think it is still also interesting, as you emphasized in, in your end, to actually see uh, what the component action underlying this is. So uh, for example, whether it's a divergence, whether it's a counter term, a quartic term in lambda and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, agree. So, so and, and I agree. I agree with you that uh, in fact, uh, in our last paper where we, where we uh, managed, I think, to provide the best analysis to our ability, we did not find a perfect square. We find a structure which has a, quart, uh, a quartic Gino term, but it's not simply a perfect square as you correctly emphasize. So this is, this is not yes. a priori <clears throat> square to that. Yeah, so I agree with that. Uh, I completely agree with that. And the only kind of uh, maybe disclaimer I want to make is that what we see is that when we evaluate everything on shell, there is the need for this kind of counter term, uh, and we can see what it has to be uh, on shell, but it's not so easy to gauge what precise form it should have off shell to give that. Uh, it would be very interesting to find out. I, I agree with you. I think that's a challenge to people who calculate brain actions to find out what this is. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental yeah. theory of the world, probably. Uh, surprisingly, this quartic term is important if that is yes, real. I agree. I, I think the, the, the nicest uh, thing we bring here is that, again, there's no need to, no, to know any of the details of the solutions to say this. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a quick question? So in, in our derivation, we used the T-duality and then essentially we found some kind of a smeared, uh, it, the action that we found looks like as if the seven brain action is smeared because there were some non-local terms. Do you yeah. think maybe the reason why we're seeing some different results in terms of divergences is because uh, we use the T-duality and hence the D-brain action or the localized gaging actions look smeared? That is some uh, lingering question that I've been having. Yes. But... I, I cannot say for sure. I think I think as you say, some some non-locality is uh, is uh, in quote unquote hidden in in the way the, the divergence divergence is cancelled uh, in your computation. Um, but I would like to 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 be more more uh, precise on that. I think I think. Uh, uh, the, na the nature of the precise emergencies, I don't know exactly uh, what it should look like and, and where it comes from. It's kind of hard to gauge. I think one 
maybe one thing that this whole analysis suggests is that smearing approximation gets, gets you closer and closer to <laughs> to what you see in the effective theory so uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's not that surprising that you're using part of that and it seems to work mm -hmm. better uh thank you so much uh we have a question from vincent, vincent? yes um i i was wondering something about your starting point so you start um with the first your spinner equation where you deform it uh, with the gagino condensate as uh Berber and Martucci um, have been doing in the past. Yeah. But this already, I mean, can you really argue that this is already like a tendy description of this Gagino condensate in this whole setup? Because you basically solve the 4DF term equation and then you add the right ingredient so that it's so that the uh, tendy equations reduce to the 4D equations. So yeah, I'm, I'm of course. Yeah, yeah. So the, of course, there's an opportunity effect in the. In the in IR, and it's, it's kind of effective. For the information in a certain sense um, of the solution at hand already. So, do you agree with that or not? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, it's not it's not a, a perfect, uh, fully ten-dimensional framework, as you as you say. I think what this is trying to capture is to to try to to gauge in some way what the, the what effects. Well, how this this the presence of this gagino condensate back reacts on the whole construction, but of course it's not. It's I agree it's not. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not a full uh, high energy yeah. description of everything that's going on. Yes, I think it would be cool if you could derive that term from first principles, like really working out in some way or another the supersymmetry equations. Um, but yeah, okay. But, yeah, clarify. we have some some. Uh, there's gonna be some 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 comments on that uh, in the paper but uh, I think in any case uh, it, it always uh, comes at least so far from what I've seen uh, it, it always uh, comes back to kind of thinking as this this localized uh, source uh, as a, as a source in the in the equations that define the geometry uh, how to how to get this this number two idea effect fully from ten dimensions? I'm 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 not sure we are there yet. Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank Nico again, uh, and let's move on to our next speaker. Yeah. So let me share.